Sometimes, you know, when people go away with, in, in between a lecture and kabhi kabhi to aankh milate bhi nahi chale jate hain. To char pungtiyan yaad aati hain. Ki rukhsat hua, to aankh mila kar nahi gaya. Rukhsat hua, to aankh mila kar nahi gaya. Wo kyun gaya? Ye bhi bata kar nahi gaya. Ishara hi kar deta, to bura bhi na maante. Wo haath ki ungliyan bhi dikha kar nahi gaya. Ah, Dr. Arun Shah is a very senior and a, a very dear neurologist, if I can use the word dear for a very senior person. Uh, he, of course, is at the Reliance Hospital, erstwhile Harkishan Das Hospital. He was my teacher when I was in my MD, 1980s, and uh, he probably was the first person in India to use thrombolytic therapy for stroke and very, very accomplished. Uh, as I said, all my patients will travel from the suburbs to town to see him. No other neurologist will do for me. Uh, I welcome Dr. Arun Shah to the stage, please. morning and I must thank Tushar for inviting me today amongst you. Uh, we have to thank you, sir. Uh, we are talking about adverse drug reactions used for neurological conditions, especially those that are seen by family physicians. Uh, may we have the first slide, please? You have to be in the limelight, sir. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so first, uh, first slide, please. One common medical problem that we see neurological is migraine, and uh, as you know, there are two types of drugs used in migraine. One are drugs that are used for acute attacks of migraine, and one uh, group are drugs that are used for preventing recurrent attacks of migraine or prophylaxis of migraine. So, sir, first of all, uh, of course, focusing on adverse drug reactions. Keeping those in mind, what is your usual first choice of acute migraine pain relief? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tushar, for asking this question. So I think uh, for acute attack of migraines, as Tushar said, there are two kinds of drugs. So those people who get, say, episode of once or twice a month or once in three months, you don't need to give them a prophylactic treatment. You need to give them only acute attack treatment. And the, in the days of triptans, in my opinion, Combination of triptan with paracetamol seems to be the best option. And of course, if this doesn't like work, then probably you go to naproxen or NSID. And so it's at the second line in my practice. What we do is generally educate them how to use triptan. It's important that triptan, you know, one has to know when to use it. So if a person says, no, mine is a mild headache, I want to avoid it, then it's not going to work. When the person gets aura or premonition that the migraine attack is hitting me, that is time to use triptan, then it works. And there are various, and, uh, at the moment in India, there are four types of triptans which are popularly available. That is sumatriptan, the rizatriptan, elmotriptan, and uh, zolmiz, zolmiz, or zolmist. Now, zolmist is the one which is available as a nasal spray. And you can spray it in the nose and it works immediately. And rizatriptan popularly now is available as mouth dissolving. The uh, rizanate is the one drug which is by it's a, like a strip and you put it in the mouth and dissolves and it works within half an hour. So triptan will be the first choice in my practice as of today. Or of course, I don't prescribe because it's still popularly available, migraine and all that. But you must remember this triptans and ergots are vasoconstrictive property. So both of these drugs should not be used in people with atherosclerotic vascular disease, which means peripheral vascular disease, coronary artery disease, stroke, TI. So this population that is after the verge of 45, 50, you won't be able to use these drugs. And then, of course, you'll have to resort to only insects as the main line of drug, right? The, the other drugs, what antiemetics and injectables, of course, I do combine paracetamol with domperidone. The popularly combinations were available, but somehow those combinations have been banned now. So probably I prescribe them separately, paracetamol 650 milligram, along with domperidone 10 milligram. Maybe that combination works in particularly people who are a little late. If they don't take their medicines early, then probably you'll have to end up with this. 
Uh, injectables, of course, are available. Uh, opioids we don't use by and large in acute unless it is your forced. And in acute attacks, other drugs which can work when it is like a status migraineosis, that is, person is in refractory migraine episodes, and nothing is working. Then, of course, apart from NSAID injection, injectable sodium vapoid, you know, injectable sodium vapoid is also fairly useful in such situations. And of course, we must remember about adverse side effects of the triptans, which I mentioned. NSAIDs, of course, you are going to discuss uh, separately. And uh, the only interesting new thing development which is occurring in acute attack is development of a new type of triptan, that is 5-UST1F receptor antagonist, which is trial is just completed and is likely to come in market in abroad, that is less done. And this could be useful even in people with coronary artery disease. So this may be a good idea. What addition. is the name again, sir? Less done. Less That's a compound. Done. Okay. which is still not commercially available, but it should be available shortly in US. And this triptan can be used even in elderly because it does not have a vasoconstrictive property. So one thing that your message can change immediately, I'll just show you how. Uh, how many of you use triptans or prescribed triptans in acute attacks of migraine? Please raise your hands. <coughs> so uh, less 10%, than the majority, 10%, very yeah. few. So I think uh, that is a message that is very clear, that triptans mm. are very effective, especially if there are no contraindications of atherosclerotic disease. And uh, you can use one of the four molecules that uh, are available. Even in first trimester of pregnancy, sometimes our second trimester, you can use uh, somatriptan is, you know, probably pregnancy category C, so if required, one can use it. So triptans are useful in the migraine acute attacks. I had heard that triptans are available with naproxen, as combination, yeah. Uh, but you said paracetamol combination also available. I would. I am. You know, naproxen, as you know, is long term. You can't keep on using it because of interstitial nephritis complications. So I have reserved first line. I told them to use paracetamol and domperidone combination along with triptan if required if it is a severe attack. Only if this fails, then of course naproxen is a good idea. Naproxen domstel combinations are available and they are also very good. And particularly if you have missed the bus, probably these, you know, headache is already established, <coughs> then triptan is not going to work. Then maybe you can resort to naproxen or uh, domperidone combination. Another drug that is often used is naproxen, as he said, but naproxen is often not used, meaning the commonest dose of naproxen used is 250. 250. Is that right or do you use 500? I mean, you can use from 250 to 500. It okay. depends on the person, but I use 250 by and large. That's and it fine. works fairly well. Okay. Uh, any any questions on acute attack of migraine therapy? Yeah, I think it's a good combination. And I, I those who have very severe attacks, it may be worthwhile using that. You were talking about but, headset brand, which is uh, a combination of naproxen mm -hmm. with sumatriptan. So, it's a good combination. And I'm, these those who are very severely migraine attacks are very severe. Sometimes this works better. But I generally use risatriptan, which is much uh, commonly available and easy, but particularly because of the mouth dissolving part of it, you know. So put it on the tongue and it gets dissolved immediately. <coughs> he is asking if uh, the established migraine acute attack, several hours have passed. Yeah, so that's what we discussed and obviously if it is not responsive, you have to go to injectables. Injectables will be, of course, uh, diclofenac is one thing which is uh, combined with uh, injectable stemetil or uh, uh, injectable probably MSET and then, of course, IV sodium vapoid. If you go to hospital at this level, you know, when it's not going for four to six hours, then we'll have to keep, take him to the hospital and maybe induction sodium vapoid can be injected over a period of hours. It's an infusion, a thousand milligram, and that probably works if this doesn't, anything else doesn't work. We'll go to the next slide. We'll, not, we'll take one or two questions maximum each slide. Uh, sir, uh, we were saying about if anybody has frequent attacks of migraine, mm -hmm. how frequent would you define as frequent? I think the anybody who suffers uh, four days a month, that's the criteria we use. Anybody who has attacks, either you cannot tolerate uh, acute attack medicines or they are not useful. And somebody <laughs> who gets at least three to four episodes a month and he rests almost four days a month, then the, he's a candidate for... Prophylactic, prophylactic therapy. therapy yeah. <clears throat> what is your first choice and based on adverse drug reactions, which would you not use? I mean, I have not included everything. You you probably use more than these. Yeah, I think I use most of this which has been mentioned. I think my, as you said, you know, you need to go through the, after all, migraine, as I always tell my patients, is a disease of lifestyle. 
and of course the stress is. So if lifestyle is a very important factor, particularly stress and all that, then probably I would resort to tricyclic as a first choice, you know, imitriptyline 10 milligram at bedtime works very well, maybe two to six, six months continuously would probably work. Not many side effects except for the dryness of mouth and constipation sometimes. It is not associated with so much of weight gain. You know, that's unnecessary bias everybody has. It does produce crogginess. So there are teething trouble. When you start, they do complain that person is croggy, cannot get up early morning. So some people are very sensitive. And of course, there are 5 milligram preparations available, but I usually use 10 milligram as their starting dose and maintain it that dose. I don't have to increase by and large and it works very well. And of course, those who are weight conscious, then you go to topiramate. Topiramate is very widely used drug, but you must know that these drugs has a lot of issues involved with it and you have to prescribe it in a proper manner. Generally, your target should be to reach about 75 milligram per day, but you can't start on very initially. You must start with only 25 milligram at bedtime, increase it to 50 milligram second week and third week 75 milligram, keep it like that for three months or so. You must warn them about parasitias, very common side effect, perioral and numbness and tingling and that is also some of them have two important problems which I have faced in my practice itself is a word finding difficulty with first dose. Sometimes first or second dose itself they say, but I had a teacher who was a, a probably prior profession and she came for my migraine and I prescribed him to pyramid and within three, four days she realized that while teaching she couldn't find words properly and she gave up the medicines and she gave up the doctor also. So important thing is remember to ex explain them there's a problem and particularly people who have refractive error, sometimes you can have transient deterioration in your number, you know, the, suddenly the refraction worsens and vision, visual distortion. So all these, you know, it is important that when you prescribe to a pyramid, you must educate them about the side effect and tell them to report to you as soon as it's done, otherwise it creates chaos, you know. It's a good drug. The most long-term problems with topiramate is, of course, glaucoma and the second problem is nephrolithiasis because it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, so it leads to this. So they must be advised to drink a lot of water. And, of course, it can be associated with weight loss. So in a thin lean patient, you don't want to prescribe them, but while generally lightly obese, it's a good drug to go on. And at least, again, any prophylactic drug you prescribe, my decision is at least give for them for three months and maybe longer if required. This How's your use of beta blockers? Beta blockers I do use, not very commonly, in the, you know, very, because I don't find them very effective. But those who are very, very worried about side effects of the most of medicine, probably beta blocker will be a good chance, but, at, uh, you know, monitoring everything. Side effect wise, it's not a problem, as you all know, beta blocker very well. And oh. funerazine also is a good drug, you know. Male patients who do not have sort of like stress, stress factor as a precipitating event and flunerzine is a good choice, first choice. You don't have to go to 10 milligram, you know, 5 milligram bedtime is good enough dose. And the problem with flunerzine, the important thing is it does lead to little drowsiness, weight gain and depression. You know, so if you have somebody has a depressive tendency, do not prescribe them. And if you prescribe them a long term, you know, it can cause Parkinsonian syndrome. I have patients who have been taking clonorazine for one or two years and he started, came up with a bradykinesia and probably difficulty in walking and we found that clonorazine was the responsible candidate. And the action of clonorazine persists in the body for almost 14 days if was with the first dose. So make sure that once you eliminate it, just wait for at least two to three weeks before deciding whether he has Parkinson's disease or it's just a side effect of clonorazine. The divalporate also is a good drug, particularly people who have depression and who require a mood stabilizing drug, then probably we should use it. It is of course, as you know, it potential of weight gain, hair loss, and in a women it will cause menstrual irregularity. So the drug is full of side effect, but at times you're faced, you know, this is a good drug to follow because if other things have failed, the divalporate works very well sometimes. So it's a good drug to keep our option with you. Uh, as you saw in this list, <coughs> at least three drugs, flunarazine, divalproate and amitriptyline cause weight gain and uh, propionol does not, topiramate of course causes weight loss. So uh, maybe the weight of the patient at that moment when you are starting treatment yeah. might be one of the factors that will uh, make you choose the drug. Would in childhood be? migraine again, uh, propionol is a good drug in childhood migraine. Childhood migraine. Uh, uh, any questions on these drugs? Divalproate dose in migraine, is it different from epilepsy? Uh, no, I think generally divalproate is once a day. So you can start uh, probably, you can reach up to 500. I don't go more than that. Two, you can start with 250 and 500 bedtime is a good dose. You can continue and that works very well. Divalproate is, you know, is a sodium vapoid. So it has problem of uh, hair loss, weight gain, 
menstrual irregularities. These are the main three important things. It does produce mood stabilizers, so there are advantages. Hepatotoxin okay. is not a very common affair. If you already have a liver disease, you want you to use it, but it's not a big issue. But I mean, I know the long term, of course, in, when you use for epilepsy, we are worried about hepatotoxicity, pancreatitis, and other things when you use large doses. When you are using for three to six months, I don't think hepatitis is a big problem. But if you have pre existing liver disease, one would avoid it, obviously. A question here was. Acute attack, acute attack drugs like tryptans, any interactions with prophylactic drugs which uh, are already by going By and on. large not, by and large not. Nothing very specific. Uh, you, uh, one person was asking whether you have to uh, go to two drug combinations for prophylaxis. Does that happen commonly? Oh, that, uh, I think these are only refractory migraines. By and large in my practice, I don't store two drugs unless person has gone around with a big file and he has taken so many medications, then I might use two drugs. But by and large, I believe only one drug at a time. I don't believe in the prescribing three. There are my colleagues who prescribe because there is only migraine practice. So he, has, he sees all refractory patients. So they start with four drugs at a time, which I don't believe in it. I think one drug is good enough at a time. And how long do you treat prophylactically? I think minimum Does migraine three have a limiting uh, mean course of disease? I, yeah, I think minimum three months. Three months okay. And then depending on how we respond, you can revise. Uh, generally, my instruction is to take it for a month. By month, if the frequency has not reduced, he should come back. So we can revise his medications. If something is working, continue for three months. And depending on his past history of duration, you can change out to up to six months also. Okay. Uh, somebody was asking about Valpro. I just remember that uh, childbearing age group migraine, which is because migraine is common in yeah. females, younger females. Valpro it is a big, big no -no, problem. So you yeah. must uh, take care of that. The patient should not get pregnant on migraine. Yeah, but it, because it, in women it doesn't work in my experience because there are many other stress factors, maybe the one of the precipitating events. So, and then they are worried about weight gain, you know. So that is the reason in my mind is not to use in that population. <laughs> okay. Uh, next slide, please. Epilepsy is not primarily treated by family physicians yeah. often, mm. but they of course have patients who are on anti-epileptics and they have to monitor for the side effects. Any any ma major instruction that you have for us? I think the, uh, as uh, Dr. Tushar has rightly classified all the drugs, so I just wish you, which are the commonly drugs I would describe is these days. As you know, we were in the era of carbazepine and probably, uh, you know, phenytoin and phenobarbidone. Uh, by and large, we feel that long term, we don't use those drugs. Phenytoin still continues to be there for acute in emergencies because of their side effects. So, phenytoin has a number of side effects. Apart from that, it has a drug drug interaction with many drugs. It also has problems so long term causing, uh, you know, osteoporosis, osteomalacia, and also can lead to cerebellar degeneration, gum hypertrophy, hirsutism, and number of side effects. So by and large, long, I, my pregnancy has been not to use phenytoin as a long term. You can use it in acute phase and then as soon as person is fine, status sometimes comes with recurrent, we have to use it, but then take it out as soon as possible. So I would not be going too much on the conventional drugs. Now the, as far as oxcarbazepine is concerned, there are in the carbazepine group, there are two new drug entrants which are there, that is oxcarbazepine and of course the eslicarbazepine. Now the advantage of oxcarbazepine is a drug which is less a side effect compared to carbazepine and only question problem will be hyponatremia incidence is slightly high. So you'll have to monitor hyponatremia as a side effect whenever a person is on oxcarbazepine. By and large there is well tolerated drug, it is used as a sodium channel drug, good in people who have partial onset seizures, not who have generalized seizures of course. And the only problem is in elderly population when there is a polytherapy, particularly if a person is a diuretic and then he is developing an oxcarbazepine, then probably hyponatremia will be detrimental and probably that's why an elderly population would like to avoid such drugs. They all have problem with drug interaction obviously, but not probably go into those details we can discuss as and when the usual drugs are discussed. Now the, the, the newer drugs again, eslicarbazepine, I have just finished the carbazepine group. The eslicarbazepine is good in the sense it has once a day dosing. So you take it bedtime and it works, it has less side effect, again hyponatremia remains a possibility as a side effect. So. It's very, very often person who cannot take twice a day, you can change your to actually carbazepine once a day, again, mainly for people with partial onset seizures. 
Now, in the newer drugs, the main drug which is you will probably see everywhere prescribed is levetiracetam. And it's a good drug. It is used for both generalized seizures as well as parallel partial organ seizures. What are the problems, side effects with that? I think this is a drug, of course, the doses ranges from anywhere from 1 gram to 3 gram per day in an adult population. The commonest problem we have found is that out 7 out of 10 patients probably with levetiracetam will complain of aggression and behavioral changes. So, be more often than not, the family which complains, person is very well elated, he, he likes the drug. But the family comes back that he has become aggressive, irritable, short-tempered. The professional colleagues also mention this. So, if you mention this, you have to get it out. And that is a commonest problem I find with uh, levetiracetam. But otherwise, it's a very good drug. And those who tolerate, I think it's a wonderful drug because it will not have interaction with any other problems. And when you have polytherapy, problems are not there. Only you have to remember is that it is again excreted 70% by kidney. So once you have a problem of uh, renal failure, you have to use it cautiously. Dose have to be lowered down and you can continue to use in people with hemodialysis also. But if you have a person who is on hemodialysis, you should not exceed dose of about 1 gram per day at the most or maybe even lesser than that. And try to supplement after a dialysis, say 500 milligram or something. After the dialysis, you supplement because it's dialyzed. So if you are keeping them on a low dose, please remember to supplement them after the dialysis session is over. Uh, any instructions to them about intranasal midazolam, <coughs> which some patients have at home for emergency use? Is it, I think, is it recommended at all? or? I mean, I see only... Uh, role of this drug is people who have cluster of general breakthrough seizures in refractory epilepsy. Sometimes we have, we have patients who get not one seizure, but they get clusters. So only in these people, private population, you probably may as well have any role. If you get just one single attack at a time and it subsides within two minutes and you posture them properly and nothing happens, there's no point in using it. Because once you use it, there will be prolonged drowsiness and then you'll get confused what's going on. So I instruct the only people who have refractory epilepsy, who are under a good epilepsy clinic and who get clustered in one after the other that That's where it is to be used. It's a good drug to be used. It is more commonly used in children than in adults. And I, in my practice, I hardly use it in say because they are very rare patients who it is really helpful. Is frisium or clobazam used in practice? Uh, yeah. Because that is one drug Correct. that they are familiar with. That's right. You know, clobazam is much easier to use, you know. But then clobazam person has to be conscious. While here, of course, person is still drowsy and you can get one spray and probably the cluster will stop. While person becomes conscious, if he has a single attack, he becomes conscious, give a 10 milligram of uh, clobazam and that also works to prevent second seizure. It works pretty well. Warpoid, we already discussed in that. All of us know that lamotrigine uh, huh, is a big the, problem. Both, both the drugs we should take together. Lamotrigine is a very, again, wonderful drug used for both generalized epilepsy as well as partial onset epilepsy. It is devoid of many other side effects. The only important side effect to be remembered with lamotrigine is that it has a very high incidence of drug reaction. So it's almost, you know, if other drugs you say 2 in 100,000, this is about 2 to 3 per, per 100. So it's a very important and you must educate them. It is mistaken. I have a patient, despite telling them, he had febrile illness, neck pain and a rash and it was treated as uh, measles or uh, chicken pox and not realizing that it was a drug reaction. So this very commonly happens. So please remember, if a person is on lamotrigine or phenytoin or oxcarbazepine or carbazepine, if he develops rash, mild fever with rash, remember drug reaction is the most likely possibility rather than anything else. And you must go through that drug list if a person is taking that medication. Yeah, Lamotrigine is, of course, uh, be very uh, useful drug for us, particularly in people who are childbearing age group because it has minimum incidence of preterogenic side effect, only 2%, which is just as good as normal population. So, very often we prepare our pa patients uh, you know, in a childbearing age, age group with Lamotrigine and change or remove other drugs and then allow them to consume. And the combination of Lamotrigine or Operate is again important thing to remember is a very additive combination. So if you have a person who is taking lamotrigine and you add 300 milligram of carbon, uh, sodium vapoid, the half-life will be increased to 60 uh, hours instead of say 8 hours. So with this is a very additive combination but if you are not aware of this, you are going to have severe adverse reaction because the lamotrigine levels will go up as soon as you add sodium vapoid. So whenever we combine this drug, we remember to give minimum dose of uh, lamotrigine in people who are already on sodium vapoid. In sometimes refractory epilepsy, you know, generalized epilepsy, absence of epilepsy, this combination is commonly used. The, the newer drug I would like to mention is yes. lecosamide. 
is another good drug which works like a uh, sodium channel on the almost similar to carbamazepine but it has little different and unique mechanism so can and you name the drug again lecosamide lecosamide uh, available as lecosat and lecosam and this is good drug it is used also in status applications because injectable is available it has fewer interactions now in fact to my mind it, it has become a drug of choice in elderly because it does not interact with many of the therapies and it has plainly hepatic metabolism so even in people with renal failure you can use fairly well without much worrying about the side effect but in in the presence of uh, liver dysfunction you have to be careful about using that drug and and except for dose related side effect that is dizziness diplopia when you use when the peak dose side effect you know there's a, all the antiepileptic drug have a common side effect of dose related which is because it they all work on the cns nervous system so whenever there is a peak level of the drug you will develop dizziness double vision uh, sometimes diplopia uh, gait ataxia so this will be happen with every drug whenever they are in a little higher dose so initial stages of all these drugs or particularly if you combine with two drugs you will get this side effect so whenever you want to add lecosamide to a person already is taking carbamazepine or something we all we reduce the level of carbamazepine and then we add it because both together when they will peak probably give you a lot of dose related cns side effect next slide please now and the last new entrant is of Sir, course ha uh, yeah i think they will tap, tapering of anti epilepsy is a too complicated subject so it's not that 5 minutes we can discuss but by and large if you have a pre existent brain lesion then uh, there is a scar in the brain that means there is a lesion in the brain in such situations it's very difficult to withdraw medications your chance of relapse will be almost 70% if you remove the drugs but of course there are situations where if things are right there is a short history of seizures and after the initial first or two seizures they are well controlled for 2 to 3 years we always give a chance of removing it depending on the other factors the eeg factors we also use Uh, sleep deprived or long prolonged eeg all that criteria and then decide whether he is a right candidate so after all you have to predict what is his probability of relapse and then decide we can remove it or not so if probability of relapse is 70% i advise them not to withdraw at all but if it is 30% then i give a trial you are talking about one more new drug uh, this this uh, ficompa or parampenol that also you will probably soon hear it's uh, becoming popular day by day it's a new drug new just introduced about two years uh, i think one and a half years in the indian market its advantage is at right the moment it is being used only for refractory it is again different new mechanism it's a ampa uh, receptor antagonist so that mechanism is not present with most of the other drugs so it is good in refractory epilepsy the advantage is it should be used only once a day and uh, doses also is very uh, 2 mg to 4 mg and works out very well can you so, please name the drug again but ficompa okay. is the great name parampenol is the compound parampenol okay. yeah so this is all again there in indian market so you are going to soon see patients which on those drugs probably she is asking whether febrile seizures ah. you can give midazolam so the you know, midazolam there are two ways of giving it intranasally one is you know there is midazolam spray which is commonly available here but there is another intranasal administration by other method and that is little more cumbersome that only doctors can do it so you should keep in their clinic lab that's still not available in india the spray of course is useful in acute emergencies you can keep and use it but then you have drugs like midazolam which can be given intramuscular so if we are doctors are going to do it use as well keep midazolam intramuscular which works much faster and it is a water water soluble so you can give it intramuscular next slide please another common uh, neurological problem that family physicians face and yes, can yeah. probably treat themselves without referring yeah. would be essential tremor yeah uh, your choice of drugs and i think you have uh, rightly put it down in a proper way so if the propranolol person tolerates propranolol and there's no history of bronchial asthma or anything i probably first thing is start using propranolol in a for 20 to 40 mg dose and then build it up up to 80 mg if it tolerates you know that's the first drug and you may combine that with a small night dose of clonazepam so this two combination may be the initial drug and the person who has very severe tremors probably these drugs may not be helpful then of course uh, you could use either topiramate or primidone or 
primidone. Primidone, of course, important thing to remember now is that it, they previously used to get only 250 milligram tablets. And that your, if you start somebody with, say, even half a tablet of 250 milligram, he will never take primidone again. So it's a drug when we were not, the lower strength was not available. I would advise them to break it in the one net and start with one net tablet first week, one fourth second week, and then reach to a half over a third week. Fortunately for that, not only now there is a company which has come out with uh, 25 milligram as a dose, yeah. 50, 25, 50, and 100. All three strengths are now available. That is known as Prolet. One of the company has come out with this. It's very similar to your beta blocker name, so be remembered. Too. So I, when I prescribe Prolet, I always write down in bracket, it is Primidone. Because very often they go to the chemist and his Prolomate is given instead of Prolet. So mm -hmm. when you prescribe, it is important that you give properly. And it works well. Primidone is very effective drug. We have to continue indefinitely. When a person tolerates, it works very well. Atopiramide also is a wonderful drug. But all these drugs, important thing to remember, essential tremor, they will only reduce it by 50 to 70 percent, not more than that. And that also, it's as you know, it's not a curative thing. You have to take lifelong. So people who have just mild tremors, I tell them, run away, don't come back till it becomes more severe. Because it's no, there's no point in, if it's not a disabling tremor, you don't have to treat it. You just have to wait. And, you know, it's only for... Uh, parties, if they want, maybe they can take a wine and go because family relations mm. level are alcohol sensitive. So you give them alcohol, they get suppressed. So maybe that's a good idea to give, particularly if social embarrassment is a factor. Once their handwriting gets affected and other things that start suffering, then maybe you'll have to treat them better rather than not treat them. Any questions on essential tremor? Those of clonazepam? I think it depends on how you tolerate. We can go up to about uh, one to two milligram. But people don't tolerate that high dose. You know, we, what we, our maximum I use is 0.75 per day. 0.5 in the night and 0.25 in the afternoon. Okay, uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. Okay. Yeah, uh, restless slide, slide syndrome. So okay. how many restless in the family, syndrome. Uh, fam I must ask the audience, how many has seen a patient of restless leg? Or have you diagnosed it? Oh, that's that's good. Very good. So people are aware of the entity. Because I see in practice this entity is missed for 20, 20 years before it reaches a proper diagnosis. So first let us tell them how to diagnose if Yeah, you can. that's right. I think the restless leg syndrome is once it is a diagnosis of only history. Good history taking and it helps you. You have people who have noxious the, the classic syndrome obviously is nocturnal pains with urge to get up and move the limbs. And that's the most classic presentation, but you will see a lot of atypical variations. Some people are even daytime, idle sitting, and they will have to keep on moving and they want to get up. They are discomfort and uncomfort uncomfortable. Well, so classic is very, even if you diagnose classic cases, that is good. They have insomnia, they have in the night, they get up and walk around and then again sleep, again the pain starts, they again walk around. So if you see that history, and the examination is totally negative. By and large, these people already have worked up, they have gone under MRI spine done, EMG done, everything has been done and they, then they come to us, okay, there is nothing found. You listen to them for 10-15 minutes and probably you can make a good diagnosis of uh, this syndrome. And uh, the unfortunate part is treatment of this disease is lifelong. You cannot cure them. You have to uh, investigate some of these patients for secondary factors. You know, sometimes you have iron deficiency, so you should uh, order their ferritin levels to be done. If they have diabetic, look at them whether they have additional problem of neuropathy or diabetic sensory neuropathy. So, and or also certain drugs exacerbate uh, this, you know, particularly drugs which will block dopamine receptors will in turn exacerbate restless leg syndrome. So, so when you treat these patients, you must go through their drug history. What are the common drugs they are taking? If they are taking amitriptyline itself is also known to, you know, sometimes they prescribe amitriptyline for pain in the night to give them a sleep and that itself might in fact worsen the restless leg syndrome. So, all that uh, points you need to remember and correct all these points and then put them on a drug. Of course, my choice of drug is Premipexol. Uh, you know, start with only a 0.25. Lowest dose is important. They even lower dose works. But uh, as uh, Dr. Kushar had pointed out sometimes, in, I think his notes he pointed out to me, is the problem of augmentation. What happens is that when they take 0.25 milligram, after three to six months, they will come back and say, this is not working now. So you start increasing it, and then you come back again, it, they say it's still not working. So that's why some people, rec workers recommend that you can start with other group of drugs such as pregabaline or gabapentin, which work, they work with a different mechanism. We probably, uh, Premipoxol and dopamine receptor agonist. So they 
increase the dopamine receptors, stimulate the dopamine receptors, and that's a basic mechanism in Restless syndrome. But since you want to avoid augmentation and other future problems, you may start with pregabalin or gabapentin to start with. And if that doesn't work, then probably add Premibexor at a later date. That may be one of the ways to tide over. So I think by and large, uh, treatment is very rewarding and many of the patients do well for many years. And sometimes failures are known, but not too many. Maybe 20% of them will have the problems where the drugs will stop working at a later date. One adverse drug reaction of these dopaminergic drugs is supposed to be impulse controlling, uh, control disorder, correct. impulse control disorder. On the long Do you see that? that? Do you? Yeah, I think we don't see so much in people with restless leg. We see more often in people with Parkinson's disease. So when we discuss that part, the doses are higher. Yeah. These are the people who develop more problems than mm -hmm. these. But plus, of course, Parkinson's, later on you start having cognitive problems and then these adverse drug reactions are much more marked. And we'll go to the next uh, slide, please. And we'll go to... She's asking if uh, leg cramps at night, mm. uh, which are, you know, often no, family physicians no, will give vitamin E and quinine. They get, these people get urged to move. Cramp is not a major manifestation. No. Yeah. Uh, in Parkinson disease, again, not something that is primarily treated by the family physician, but they mm. see, they'll see the side effects of drugs. Yeah, because this, I think the imp uh, very important because most of them are on long-term therapy and probably they have these medications which produce a lot of side effects, you know. The, uh, in the, as far as the dopaminergic drugs, that is levodopa, carbidopa is concerned, the, you know, the important side effect to be remembered is the when they take medicines initially. The commonest side effect they will com complain is nausea and vomiting and dizziness. You know, when the drug hits the brain, they feel dizzy and this is a common, almost 70-80% of patients will tell you that. There is no way to avoid this. Is okay, if you have nausea and vomiting, only thing I tell them is to take Domperidone and after 15 minutes take the dose of levodopa, carbidopa, and sometimes this works. But they have to. You have to educate them that you have to tide over that that side effect. You can't avoid it. But the other more important side effects which you get as the time goes is what is called as motor fluctuations. So that the first thing happens is motor fluctuations. There are two things happen in motor fluctuations. What we call as that the drug stops working. So after say initially first couple of years when you give them levodopa, carbidopa, they don't even realize, they feel so nice whole day. After about say year or two, they will come back and tell you that the drug works only for three hours and why the dose is due after four hours, I become again slow. So that's called varying of phenomena. That's the first feature of motor fluctuations as you call it. And then as the time goes, you keep on increasing the dose, they start having the other types of motor fluctuations and that's called dyskinesia. That means the drug works excessively and they start dancing as soon as the peak dose effects. So they like that dancing because that is the time they have power, they can move around. If they don't take the medicines, probably they are still and they can't walk. So this kinesia is a very troublesome side effect which starts generally in about 50% of patients after about 5 years of therapy. Particularly people, people who are young onset Parkinson's, say Parkinson's starting either 40, 45 or 50. These are the people who would probably observe these same side effects much more than others. And the uh, only other important, not other systemic side effect of levodopa, carbidopa, one has to remove is glaucoma. So make sure that eye pressures are checked intermittently, you know, and liver enzymes you can check intermittently from the other point of view is concerned. And finally, the other, uh, the next group of side effects is the side effects which we just mentioned is impulse control disorder, behavioral problem. So they start off with simple things like hallucinations and delusion. That is the first important side effects they start having. Whenever the drug is working, evening hours, they will see people sitting around and it's a common problem which we face and particularly much more occurs in the evening hours, more than more than the morning hours when the light is less. And uh, delusional ideas are also very, sometimes, you know, they have fixed ideas that something is happening or somebody has become paranoid. So this psychosis symptoms start also after about four, four, four to five years of Parkinson therapy. And then, of course, the impulse control disorder because, you know, dopamine is a hormone for motivation and reward. Reward motivation system is there. So what is impulse control disorder is mainly people become impulsive and they have compulsive behavior. They may like to do the same thing again and again, even though initially it is a thing which they do which gives you reward, like gambling or shopping, you know, you shop something and you feel better. So you may do just do that activity. But after that, even if it is harmful, they will continue to do it. So that, that kind of compulsive behavior they have. 
So this situation, of course, comparatively rare, you know, 17 to 2% or so, not very high, but hallucinations, delusions, psychosis is much more commoner side effect. And the, these side effects are more often when we combine levodopa with the uh, the agonist that is pramipexol and all that. So when you face this situation, first thing we do is remove the the agonist, pramipexol or ropinorol, whichever is there. First we remove that and then try to reduce the dose little bit and try to give antipsychotics if required. But you can't use uh, in your typical neural neuroleptic drugs. You have to use atypical neuroleptic drugs. And of course, drug of choice we face sometimes is quetiapine. So and that doesn't work, then we go to higher level. So because these drugs do not worsen Parkinsonian syndrome, maybe those are the drugs we must use. And if you see all this behavioral side effect again in people who have cognitive problems. So about 20% of patients with Parkinson's ultimately develop dementia. Not everybody develops dementia, only 20%. So when they develop dementia, that is the time these behavioral side effects are much more marked, cause insomnia and all this occurs. So the problem of Parkinson's levodopa is important to remember it causes insomnia as well. So ask your patients to take last dose at 8 o'clock, not beyond that, you know, if you take less dose, then probably it will cause more problem. Another problem with uh, uh, levodopa carbidopa is said to be food drug interaction. Yeah. What do you advise the patient? Yeah, I think the, this is a little complex thing in the sense that the, uh, two issues in that, first of all, that if you, it is better to take levodopa on empty stomach, but if you try giving levodopa on empty stomach to a person who I'm just diagnosed, he will never take it again. So I do not prescribe because of nausea. to take it. Because yeah, of nausea. It's a lot of gastric side effect they have. So I recommend them to take say 15 minutes after breakfast or one hour after lunch. Now so that is the timing I give them to start with. And then when they get used to it, maybe you can change over to empty stomach because it works better on empty stomach than if you give it. And food may be delayed after one hour after the dose. Other problem we face is a protein meal. So particularly people who are, you know, non-vegetarian and they take a lot of uh, high meats products in the afternoon hours and then they will come back and tell you afternoon dose doesn't work at all because those is a dopamine, levodopa is a neutral amino acid. So levodopa has to go into the brain to be converted into dopamine. So when you take a protein meal, the other neutral amino acids in pro to have food probably compete, you know, there's the same pathway which takes them to the brain and then your levodopa doesn't work. So we, I always advise them, particularly advanced patients, these are not issues with the early patients, that you probably take your proteins in the evening or only dinner, don't use only carbohydrates and very low proteins in the lunch time and that works out sometimes better with them. Another thing that we family physicians can rectify in patients who are taking uh, drug is oh, remove pyridoxine or B6 from yeah. their prescriptions. So that is very commonly given. Is it important yeah. to... I mean, now that we combined uh, with carbidopa, okay. this is less and less of uh, clinic. You know, it's a pharmacokinetic drug we always thought in second MBBS that you must remember these as an important factor. But what now we are doing is plain levodopa nobody gives. Levodopa is always combined with carbidopa. In that situation, the, this enzymatic action has not so much of a role. Important. But still, it would be a good idea to avoid and use only other drugs which do not contain high dose of uh, pyridoxine. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. That's the ideal thing to do. If a patient tolerates an empty stomach and he takes food, say, half an hour, one hour later, is the ideal thing to do. I agree with that. But very often patients would not tolerate, particularly in, when you start the medications, they don't tolerate. So always initially you can give them, you know, after half, half an hour after food and then gradually when he goes more advanced, you can change over to the method you talked about. Uh, Adcapone, just introduce them to Yeah, it's very, huh, it's, uh, there are other two, three drugs which are used. One is MAO-BEO inhibitors, uh, salagiline, and, which was earlier and now of course what is available is resagaline. Now, this drug is good drug in the sense that it does have a little bit of Parkinsonian effect for the motor part and it is usually combined with other drugs and there are some data that it is a neuroprotective. So, people who are very early, don't have much defect, we may start them on just resagaline and follow them up without adding Sindopa because after all, Sindopa is a symptomatic drug and if you can avoid it in early stages, probably you can avoid that. So, resagaline is one drug and anticapon is anticapon is the COMT inhibitor. So now we have combinations available where you have levodopa, carbidopa, 
and uh, at, at Capon together, and Capon. So the advantage is now, again, the peripheral side effects are reduced, and with the same dose of levodopa, you get 30% more effect in the brain, because COMT is uptake inhibitor. So levodopa, which is, is not metabolized, is reuptake that takes place into the nerve. So this is a combination which is a useful combination to come out. I think the new drug which we will probably soon be hearing, which is now still not available, is cefinamide, which is available as Zedago. And as a, these are a different mechanisms. Some of my patients have imported using it. So in advanced Parkinson's disease, when you have a lot of motor fluctuations, you, you know, you find that your maximum dolyodopa dose is already achieved. Adding all these drugs probably helps them. So that should be available soon in our country. So only uh, there are no other new drugs at the moment, but there are. You must have heard of video of epimorphine. So I am not going to comment on that because this is not our hospital yet. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, again, dementia uh, drugs are not very, uh, not usually initiated by the family physician. Right. But they will have patients who are on these drugs, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, whether you can tell us about uh, dose drug reactions yeah. that they have to monitor. Right, I think the, uh, you know, increasingly the Alzheimer's and uh, vascular dementias and different other degenerative dementias are more and more common and you would probably hear these drugs prescribed in many of our patients. So, there are basically only two kinds of drugs available for uh, evidence-based medicine in patients with uh, Alzheimer's dementia. Is one, those are cholinesterase inhibitors and the other group is NMDA receptor antagonists. Now, the NMDA receptor antagonist, which is only one compound available, is memantamine. You'll have Admenta is one of the brand name. Now, I'll just finish off this because they do not have much systemic side effect. It's a small dose. You have to do twice a day. It does not have too much of systemic side effect. Little bit of behavioral side effect, but otherwise it's a good drug to use. And But it's useful in moderate and advanced. It's not so, so much indicated in al early Alzheimer's disease. Now, cholinesterase inhibitor is a big group. There are three compounds available in India. It is uh, rivastigmine, uh, donopazil, and uh, galantamine. Now, all these drugs, obviously, because they are inhibiting the cholinesterase enzyme, you will have side effect because of excess of acetylcholine. So, it probably uh, common, it, it, these drugs definitely increase morbidity and mortality in patients with cardiac disease. So, if you have a cardiac disease, I would rather avoid these drugs because after all, what is the role of these drugs? No Cochrane review, if you read, all these drugs have minimal value in patients with Alzheimer's disease. It may reduce their behavioral problems a little bit. Cognitive impro improvement is marginal. So whenever you, there is an issue of drug interaction and cardiologic products like arrhythmias or coronary artery disease, probably we should think 10 times before adding these drugs. And the commonest side of case, of course, is nausea and vomiting and diarrhea because of the increased acetylcholine, you know. So this is the commonest side effect. So you tend to give them at a lower dose, start at that time so that they have less side effect and then gradually build up the dose. Now, donopazil is one time. Fortunately, it's a single dose. You give only at bedtime and gradually build up up to about 10 milligram per day. In advanced cases, 23 milligram of donopazil is recommended, but whether it is useful is probably still debatable. Now, rivastigmine, of course, is a BID doses, and the doses are available as 1.5 milligram, and 3 milligram, and 6 milligram. Maximum, we reach up to 12 milligram. It is a twice a day dose, morning, evening. And fortunately for rivastigmine, is one we have is a patch. And patch is available as 4.5, 9 milligram, and 13.5 milligram. The advantage of patch is that it is a uniform distribution. You avoid GI side effect, and you get a good effect whole day. So, all moderate dementias, we change over from lows to patch. The patch problem in our country is because of the humidity, we get a lot of side effect. The skin reaction is a common problem we face with patch also. And uh, this probably this as far as the... Uh, One thing I that think. sir mentioned here mm -hmm. is uh, that the Cochrane reviews, C-O-C-H-R-A-N-E, I am not sure whether everybody knows about Cochrane reviews. Cochrane reviews are basically statistical uh, meta-analysis uh, done by an organization which tells us what exactly is the evidence so far and uh, you can go to the uh, to Google and ask for Cochrane review regarding say something or the other. Uh, if Cochrane reviews say that the evidence is weak, why are they so frequently used? I mean, I mean, is it because we have nothing to do? Simple answer is exactly. Hmm. I think unfortunately the Alzheimer's field is you know, the 10th 
to 15 years, there are at least about 8 to 10 new compounds have been reached up to phase 3 and then failed. Recently, we last lecture I gave, I written this is a new adacumoma, it's a monoclonal antibody, which is likely to be a good drug. And uh, just uh, last week, there is an issue that they have stopped the trial because it's failed. So last 10 years, 15 years, different pathways of looking at amyloid path uh, pathway in the interact with them. So reduce amyloid, you know, that's the whole pathway right now was going on. And all the trials have failed except for the pre-dementia trial. That means you take up patients who are likely to have dementia. And that's, a, you know, there are a whole story there that you can you do a marker so you can diagnose a person is likely to have dementia, say, 20 years before he develops cognitive symptoms and then give them a drug. And that trials are going on. Pfizer has a couple of compounds. That is the only live, uh, active trial which I know of, which have some likely benefit. But most of the trials in Alzheimer's have failed. So you don't expect any new compound in the near future. May we come to the next slide, please? So that reminds me, I forgot to mention very important advance in uh, migraine prophylaxis. And that is the uh, CGRP antibody, monoclonal antibodies. And this will be good for people with refractory. This is injectable. You have to take only one injection every month and forget about it. It does not have any immunosuppressive therapy. So I think this is going to be popular in refractory migraine patients. And soon you will be hearing there are two or three injections all type of you know, drugs which are already available abroad and which should be become available soon here. We'll have uh, one last slide because we are uh, fairly b behind time. So we'll just talk about this last thing, sir. Yeah, uh, this is very This important. is something that they have yeah, to face very commonly. Correct. I therapy. think this is an issue which of dual antiplatelet therapy and this is very important to my heart you know, because I see a lot of complications of dual antiplatelet and they are prescribed indiscriminately, let us put it this way. The evidence-based trial in relation to stroke prevention, stricternic stroke prevention and primary stroke prevention has shown that person who get a minor TI or a stroke and you put them on two antiplatelet is good up to about 21 days only. After 21 days, if you continue further dual antiplatelet therapy, it increases the risk of systemic hemorrhages, also risk of potential risk of brain hemorrhages and create no advantage whatsoever. So now the point trial which is published in the New England Journal last year, if you read that trial, that a person who comes with a minor stroke who is not a candidate of thrombolytic therapy, you may give them dual antiplatelet which consists of 300 milligram of aspirin or 150 milligram of aspirin along with about 300 milligram of clopidogrel, continue for 21 days and then go back to only one antiplatelet. So please look at your patient's study. Unless he has a stain somewhere here or here, he is not a candidate for dual therapy. He is a candidate only for triple. So all these combinations, diplate and clopidogrel, and it should be removed and you go back to one single drug, either whichever you like, clopidogrel or aspirin, but do not continue dual. I remember an incident which occurred just about a month ago that a patient came to me for some other purpose. He was on, that lady was on clopid, uh, clopidiplate A. So I said, okay, why are you taking diplate A? I said, no, the cardiologist advised this, that. I said, you have stand? He said, no, no stand. So I said, please request your clopidogrel and go back to single drug. So they probably discussed with cardiologists or I don't know. About a week later, she was admitted in Bridge Candy with a huge hemorrhage and we lost her. And then they were asking me, sir, it was the right decision not to remove, we, did, we delayed the decision to remove it. Was it responsible? I said, no, I don't know, but that's a possibility. So please go back to this idea, very important, that this dual antiplatelet therapy we are prescribing, it's not evidence-based and it's over-prescription in our country, particularly in relation to stroke, which is, I do not know about coronary artery disease, but as far as brain is concerned, we don't need dual drugs after first three weeks. Even in coronary artery disease, the recommendations have shortened, but we'll discuss that next uh, next Sunday. That, I think, the uh, from carotid stent is concerned, we say that six months you should be on dual antiplatelet. As far as uh, coronary arteries, they Same. have their own six guidelines, so the, I would not recommend on limit. that. Yeah, that's In a, coronary uh, and uh, carotid, I think yeah. six months should now be the limit of dual antibiotic. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, yeah. uh, we will uh, thank you. give him thank a big you. hand. Yeah.